This is the Parenting ADHD Podcast with Penny Williams. Each week, Penny shares proven ADHD parenting strategies and her hard-won ADHD mama wisdom. This is not your physician's podcast. Penny discusses the genuine grit of the moment-by-moment peaks and valleys of this special parenthood. It's time to beat the chaos and challenges of raising a child with ADHD. Here's your host, Penny Williams. Thanks for joining me on the Parenting ADHD podcast today. I am super, super excited to have Ben Glenn, also known as the Chalk Guy, with me to talk about um, growing up with ADHD, finding your passion, and um, how to turn it into, I think, opportunity. Um, Ben struggled with attention deficit disorder throughout his formative years, ultimately finding it impossible to stay interested in school and leaving following his junior year in college. Although his ADD caused him to struggle academically, it proved to be a perfect companion in his career as a performer, creator, and educator. Rather than let it hold him back, he chose to be inspired by his condition. He uses it as a tool for writing, speaking, and making videos focused on ADHD and personal development. Ben's speaking engagements began spontaneously after his short-lived collegiate career when he was presented with the opportunity to tell his story at small church camps and conferences. He has since expanded his outreach by working with students, teachers, and speaking at corporate events. Ben is the published author of seven books and the founder of Chalk Guy's Lego Drive Project. When he isn't working, Ben enjoys fishing, boxing, and spending time with his wife and two daughters. Thanks for joining me today, Ben. I'm really excited to talk to you and, and to share your story with our audience. You bet. Thank you so much for having me, Penny. And you, you read that really good. I'm, think, I'm sitting here listening. I'm like, <laughs> she could read my books for Amazon Prime. Oh. Yeah, so yeah, I got to get all, all my books on uh, audio tape because you yeah. know most of the people that that need them are like me and would much rather listen to them than read them. So absolutely, yeah, yeah I got to do that job. with my own. Well, thank oh. you. Um, so why don't you just start out with telling us your story? You know what growing up with ADHD and learning disabilities was like, and um, how you kind of found the positive in it, and and were able to make that shift. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll keep it short just so that we can get to the good stuff and, and uh, address some of the things that maybe some of the parents are really want to dive into as far as, uh, you know, working with their kids. But uh, like most of the stories that, that you've heard, some teacher recognized that I was falling behind and uh, parents could see that I was struggling with homework, you know, those parent teacher conferences. And, mm-hmm. and then eventually um, what was what was discovered first were the learning disabilities. It was the reading comprehension, the spelling, it was the grammar. It was just a lot of the academic uh, issues. And so when I got diagnosed, uh, my first diagnosis was uh, LD, uh, learning disabled, and that landed me in the special ed classroom. And, you know, they've changed things uh, since I was in school, you know, now they have the inclusion classes, Mm -hmm. but back in the day they used to pluck you out and put you in a small teeny little classroom away from everybody else, which really did make you feel like there was something wrong. Right. And and I think that, uh, well, they figured that out. You know, the kids, they've got so much going on inside their mind that putting them in this separate class away from their friends uh, can create some other mental struggles that uh, go beyond the characteristics of the diagnoses that, that these kids have. And um, sometimes those those blockages make it impossible for these kids to be willing and wanting to learn. And uh, and so for the longest time I, I did, I felt like I was a mistake. I, mm. I was down in this special ed class and I had two classmates and one kid uh, back then I, they called it BD. I think it's that ODD now, or uh, they keep changing these letters and right. Hey, I'm dyslexic. So, you know, just, Hey, just help <laughs> me out. Tell me what it is. Right. But um, the, uh, they, he had what they called BD, which was the behavior disorder. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kid was pure entertainment. But I'd watch that kid. <laughs> like, Man, how many Mountain Dews did you drink this morning? But, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the other classmate I had was uh, she had Down syndrome. And, um, and so it was just the three of us. And it was a small school in Illinois. And so we were called the Three Stooges. And, you know, going to that class every day as a young kid, trying to 
to fit in. I mean, you know, one of the things that parents will ask me at events is, you know, you're around kids a lot and, and you're, you're um, talking to them. What do you think is one of the most important things to my kid? And uh, as much as we want it to be academics or, or maybe something spiritual or, uh, you know, doing the right thing, it really is trying to fit in, trying to find, yeah. uh, you know, your place with some friends. And, um, and so, you know, when you're diagnosed with something like this and taken away, it, it, you're different. And uh, so you've got to contend with that. And, and then when other kids figure that out, um, maybe not intentionally, but what would be considered bullying these days, uh, you know, these kids are just saying what's on their mind and, and not recognizing that some of those things that they're saying are hurtful and right. are causing even, you know, greater mental stress for that kid with these, uh, or, you know, for the, with these challenges like what I had. And so, you know, for the longest time, I felt like, man, there's something wrong. God made a mistake when he put me together and, oh. you know, I'm, I'm not going to ever amount to anything. And, you know, when my mom would get frustrated, she would either chase me with the wooden spoon as that was her form of discipline or she in out of impulse and and here's the thing that most parents are starting to recognize is their kids are getting diagnosed and that is is that as their child goes through that process if they go to the psychologist this is this is what i've noticed versus going to just a regular pediatrician because you can go to you know meet with the pediatrician and be like hey my uh my kid's really really hyper Right. I need a prescription for uh, something or another, and and a lot of times you'll get it, mm -hmm. but a psychologist will, will will dive deeper, and that's what you want because you you could have two or more different diagnoses, you know, coexisting at the same time, and you want to be able to address all of those, and um, and so when uh, when we discovered that I had these issues, we realized where it all came from. My mom, it's hereditary. I right. mean, she's the queen bee of ADD. And, uh, and so when she'd get angry, she'd say things that were, you know, probably out of impulse and mm -hmm. she'd say things like one day you're going to have kids and they're going to be just like you. And, uh, she was right. I've got <laughs> one, uh, just like me. And then one time she said, you're going to be a ditch digger, Ben. <laughs> and so, you know, if you don't, if you don't get your homework done, you're going to be digging ditches. Oh, and, no. And so that sticks in the back of your mind as you're going through this and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm not like every other kid. I've got all these academic issues. So I just I'm going to go get a shovel and start digging the ditch. And uh, but thankfully, um, I, I had some great teachers and uh, and my mom really was a superhero. Uh, even though they're the, those were those impulsive moments. And I say that for parents listening to this because every parent has that boiling point. Absolutely. It, it does not matter how much you love your child and, and they are your greatest investment. There is that moment where your kid can push that button. Yeah. And before you know it, and especially if you have ADD and it's likely if your child has it, you also have it or one, you know, you or your spouse or mm -hmm. your, uh, you know, uh, and so <laughs> my mom, you know, she had it and, and, uh, and, and though she, you know, had those moments, she still really was one of the greatest encouragers for me. And so through the influence of some very, very great teachers and uh, my mom, I started seeing that, okay, there's some possibilities and potential here. And I think it, it, what you want to get a kid to come to is that place of willingness to try, Yeah, you know, and that's, and that's a difficult thing. I mean, you, you know, you can have a great, amazing teacher with all of this wonderful ability and skill to educate. But if you don't have somebody on the other side who is teachable, then right. well, how are you going to move forward? And, uh, and for a long time I wasn't teachable, but when I became teachable, um, you know, things started to slowly, and that's a, that's a key word there, slowly progress in, in the right direction. So. Yeah. And I think teachable also depends on the teacher and their understanding of the student and how they oh learn. Oh my gosh, and, yes. You yes. know, there's so many factors that go into teachability besides just our kids and, um, you know, <clears throat> how they're performing in the classroom. Um, that classroom environment goes into it. The teacher's approach goes into it. Right. Um, you know, my son has been told a lot to try harder because he has a high IQ and they can see that and talking to him, they 
often believe that if he just tries harder, <laughs> he can succeed to his potential <clears throat> where his intelligence is. And, you know, so then he gets upset. He shuts down. He doesn't want to do the work. He doesn't want to go to school. And, you know, so that teachability has just completely gone out the window. So, so many factors in that. Um, did you... Well, one really big thing, I just want to touch on something you yeah. said. And, and um, this is like when I was reading your book, um, there are little nuggets that you threw out. And I'm like, oh, that's so good. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that the parents that are listening to this need to know is that a lot of these kids that have this diagnosis, they are brilliant. Yes. And it gets overlooked. It really does. Mm-hmm. It, you know, if you think about it, to get the label, the, the official diagnosis of ADHD from a psychologist, somebody who does that long study and, and does that background and, and all that research, there's got to be a, uh, um, certain things that are creating issues on a daily basis. You know, it's creating struggles consistently. Right. It's not just a one-off thing. And so, you know, I think sometimes it's those characteristics that get you know, so, uh, so much attention that we forget and, or some of these parents listening to this podcast don't know your kid is stinking brilliant. There is so much potential there. Now the challenge is, and like what you just described is, okay, how do we tap into that? Right. And, and, and and do it in a way that a kid responds. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I just, I I needed to say, because I think that, that parents that are listening to this, you know, I, I want them, and I know you do too, and that's why you do this, to be so encouraged with the, the potential. You right. know, there's so much discouragement with these labels and these struggles, and, and even on a daily basis, that you need to have some kind of a silver lining out there keeping you motivated and inspired to know that eventually there there is success in the future if you stick right. with it. You know, right. if you if you crock pot it, you know, it's going to yeah. take a while. It's not long-term. it's not going to be a McDonald's drive through you know, experience. <laughs> it's going to be, be a long process. But anyway, you were asking me a question. I cut you off. No, that's OK. I, and two, I want to speak to your point about our kids being brilliant. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they have a high IQ. You know, they can be brilliant in other ways. They can be brilliant um, in creativity or problem solving or, you know, all these other aspects aspects, um, you know, because someone will sit back and go, well, my kid isn't that smart or he doesn't have a high IQ, but I guarantee you he has something in there that oh, yeah. he's good at, <clears throat> that he's passionate about, that he's talented in, you know, and that's part of our job as parents, especially when we have special needs kids is to help them discover those good parts and then yeah. nurture them and, and make them into um, a way to be successful. Um, so I just wanted to say that, too, because brilliance isn't necessarily just intelligence in my mind. Um, oh, absolutely not. I, I think just even to, to highlight that even more, um, there's so many kids that are out there that have this that may not be book smart. But, oh, my gosh, they are so good with understanding people mm-hmm. um, that they, they they are so intuitive to uh, their surroundings. And, you know, those are the ones that become the amazing salesmen. You know, they just know how to to work a a, a room or work a, right. a, a crowd or, or uh, but you know, give them a book and say, "Hey, read this paragraph and then tell me what you just read." Forget it. You know, right. they're just not going to they're just not going to be able to do that. And so you're you're absolutely right. I, I did one of the books that I wrote a while back um, was called the the peaks and pitfalls of ADHD, and the whole idea behind that book was helping parents and teachers to recognize that a lot of times these things that we see as pitfalls. There is a, there's a flip side to that. And, and if you don't take the time to be mindful of the potential good that could come out of this thing that's really just driving you nuts right now, mm-hmm. um, you're going to miss it. And, and like yeah. you said, to nurture those things, you have to first identify those things. And so those are the parents that are listening to this that have younger kids. You're the ones that are kind of right now probably in that real frustrated state of, okay, is there anything good going to come out of this? I keep hearing about possibilities and potential. And a lot of that's going to be you taking that time to deliberately look at, okay, well, this is driving me nuts, but what, uh, what are some possibilities that this, this crazy thing could grow into? Right. And, exactly. Uh, and I'm, and I'm doing that myself with my 10 year old, you know, she's, she does a lot of things that are like off the hook nuts. And I'm like, okay, there's something here. I just got to find out. <laughs> you got to harness is. it. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're going to harness it. Um, I was going to ask, I think, um, before was, did you stay in, um, a separate classroom all the way through high school? (laughs) Well, so that's a funny story. So, (laughs) (laughs) and I wouldn't have guessed that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes, no kid liked being in that class. And the, the no, idea, it calls you out. Oh man, it's well. For the longest time, I would I I lied about it. I mean, kids would be asking me, "Hey, where where do you go all day? We we ride to the school on the bus with you, and then you're gone. We see you sometimes at lunch, but then you're gone all right. day." And for the longest time, I was like, "Well, you guys are stupid. I'm smarter than you are. They're bringing <laughs> me down here because you guys are morons." And you know, they didn't know any better, and so right. I just kind of faked it for a while, and then and then eventually they figured it out. That's so funny. Um, but when uh, when my parents, my dad got transferred to a different uh, job, um, some of my files got misplaced, and so when I started at this new school. Um, they knew that I had some struggles, but they didn't know how much. And so they, they worked it down from where I was going the whole day to an hour. And oh the thing about this school was their special ed classroom really was in a dungeon. There's no other – it's you had to walk outside into a mm-hmm. little courtyard – and underneath the gymnasium next to like the boiler and all these pipes and everything, there was a room that I, I remember it. I mean, it was like, not, like yesterday, the door was green and it was a thick metal green door. And then when you opened that door, it, you know, there was a classroom behind there with all of us kind of, you know, interesting kids. And, uh, and so every kid wanted to get out. And so only having to go there for an hour, I figured, you know what, I could do this. But I had to come up with a way to stay in the mainstream level classroom. Right. And so I became a very, very, very good cheater. And uh, <laughs> I would, oh, yeah, I cheated really good. In fact, one of my books, I wrote a chapter called Cheating 101. And the, um, the really cool thing about that was it showed my initiative in trying to hunt down these answers because – uh, most of that cheating happened before the test. I'd go around and try to find the smart kids and I'd have to, you know, chum them up a little bit and then, uh, Hey, what, what, you know, what's the answer to this or what's the answer, answer to that. And, um, sometimes I'd make really small little cheat sheets and, and little did I know that it, as I would make that cheat sheet, I was learning the You're information. And, and so I got caught. Um, and my teacher was brilliant. He could have, uh, just done the easy thing and said, Hey, you're, go to principal this, you know, you, you're going to get a zero on this. And, um, but he caught me and uh, he grabbed my cheat sheet and he looked at it. He started laughing. He's like, man, you did so much work to get all this on a, on a gum wrapper size piece of paper. (laughs) And he looks at me and he starts asking me the questions and and I don't have my cheat sheet, but I just, I know the answers because I just spent all this time writing them out. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and so here was the accommodation. And this is, this is, is a great story for, the fact that we need to be creative in finding ways to connect with these kids and helping them to, uh, you know, to learn. And so he said, all right, before every test, I want you to do everything that you've done before. And you need to turn in a cheat sheet to me just like this before every test. And it worked. And so, um, you know, I was able to end up staying in the mainstream level for the, for the whole entire year in the fifth grade. And then, uh, when I went off into the sixth grade, things did get a little bit more difficult. Um, and I ended up going in there for a couple of hours uh, during the day. And eventually, by the time I was a junior, senior, it was back down to an hour a day. And, awesome. uh, and you know, and it was good because then when I did end up going to college, all of those um, accommodations were still made available because I had a, uh, you know, the, the what is it, the 501? 504. 504 plan. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it was really nice to be able to have that. And in college, I mean, by the time you get to that age and you've been through a lot of the things that I, I was through, I just didn't give a care what people thought, you know, I just wanted right. to get, do well. And, and I mean, I'm paying for this. And so, you know, I'm going to pass these classes and, you know, get a degree, which I never got. So, <laughs> but you definitely found the motivation in some way to at least get through high school and succeed. You know, you, um, 
almost tricked yourself into doing well by creating these cheat sheets you were studying. And, you know, I think a lot of us parents really struggle to find motivation for our kids to do well in school. They just, and, and it stems from the fact that they are so spent by the time that they're done trying to hold it together for seven hours every day. They don't want to come home and do more of that work or oh even gosh. think about yeah. it. Um, and yet they have homework. to. I hate it. I do I too. Homework. Yeah, well, it, it's like, okay, you know, my, my daughter will come home and it, it, she'll just kind of mope in. And, you know, she's just like, Dad, can I have a break? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, is that if she has that break, that break is going to just, you know, right. it's going to lead into just her wanting to just sloth around on the couch. And, man, you know, it's just like, OK, do we need to have 10 problems? Can we figure out if she knows this in five problems? Exactly. You know? And then <laughs> I think the worst part of it is, is that all that homework falls on me. And I wasn't very good in school and they right. keep changing stuff. And I'm like, I don't know this new math. I mean, we were doing it this way, and now you guys have all these boxes, and I have no idea what those right. are for. Oh, yeah. No. New math stinks. Oh, my it's gosh. terrible. I think, personally, if you can come up with the correct answer, who cares how you did it or if you wrote it down? That's my own personal feeling. Good but, <laughs> you know, they have to show their work for 50% right. of the grade. And, you know, for kids who have learning disabilities, anyway, I could go on forever about that struggle, but... You know, personal struggles with math and showing your work. And, um, you know, at some point you kind of have to, or I have at least, um, accepted mediocre as far as school goes. And I know that sounds super terrible, but, you know, I have learned over the years with struggling and struggling and struggling with school that um, he's not going to succeed in the same way that. I did or that I'm used to, you know, sure. that neurotypical people with no learning disabilities succeed. So you have to rewrite that definition of success for your own child. And, um, you know, while he is smart enough to have straight A's, he has learning disabilities and ADHD and high functioning autism. And that prevents him from succeeding under those expectations and in that environment. Sure. And so, you know, our definition of success has to be different. But then I still look at, you know, how do I make sure that he gets through high school in a way that he is going to be able to do what he wants to do after, whether that's college or, you know, a, a creative career or whatever he wants to do that makes him happy. You know, if it is college or it does require college, are we going to do well enough in high school under his definition of success to make that happen? You know, that's just sure. a common worry for parents. And then we say, well, you know, my son certainly is not motivated to do well in school, not at all. He would much rather it didn't exist. Um, <laughs> when he started as a freshman this year in high school, he talked about how he was not doing four years and he didn't care if he graduated. He could not do four years there. Um, and I get it. You know, I mean, I've spent the last almost nine years now obsessively researching ADHD and learning disabilities. And so... I have a pretty good understanding, not the understanding of, you know, knowing what it's like myself, but um, everything that I could learn outside of that, of what it's like for him during the day, every day. And it is kind of torturous for a lot of our kids. And so, you know, they don't have that intrinsic motivation. Sure. Um you know, yours sounds like it kind of came out of wanting to get out of the dungeon and not be oh, gosh, in yeah. the special ed class, you know, and, and I can see that really being motivated because kids are so judgmental of each other. And, um, mm. you know, so parents are, I think, really, a lot of us are struggling with how do we help them find some sort of motivation to get through school to um, do well enough 
you know, right. to, to right. be able to be successful after that. And I, I have often thought, um, the older my son got that if we can just get through public school, then in college or in career, he can choose something that's of interest that he's right. good at. He gets more control over his destiny where in public school, you're told you're going to learn this. This is how you're going to show me how you learned it. And we're not going to negotiate or discuss it. <laughs> Sure. No, so, I, you know, how do we help them find those passions and and be able to kind of accept the status quo until they get to the point where they can choose their destiny? Well, I mean, I think of a lot of, a lot of it is just continuing to be creative and figure out what that carrot is. You know, mm-hmm. what is that carrot of motivation? And, um, you know, I've been really working a lot on uh, creating some content on how to encourage students and, uh, you know, even like young adults that are out of college to answer that question. Why, why should I do this? And it's got to go a lot deeper than cause, or I don't know. (laughs) And, and it's that motivation that you find in that why, and, you know, how much pain are you willing to go through in order to do the thing you don't want to do? Um, I think a lot of what you're describing is these kids don't have a why, you know, there's no reason why they, they want to do it other than mom and dad are, are saying, you know, their only motivation is that they don't want to have to listen to mom and dad scream at them. Right. Because, you know, we know that they need to get it done because if they don't get it done, then we're going to get a phone call from the teacher and then we got to go in and meet with them and, you know, try to figure out what's going on. Well, he just isn't inspired. And, and so it's a really, really difficult thing. And yet I think that if you can figure out like, and, and I think, you know, Penny, you're doing a really good job with describing these things for your son is and that, OK, here's why you need to do this, because when you do graduate from from high school, you want to have the opportunities to go do the things that you need to do. But some of those things are going to be determined by what you've done here in high school mm-hmm. you know, to get into a college. You've got to have a certain type, you know, certain type of grades. Right. Yeah. Uh, we just had that conversation Saturday. Again, you know. <laughs> well, and, yeah, well, and it's funny because the again, yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's the ADD parent right there. You're gonna talk about nonstop, dead horse. relentless. <laughs> yeah, right. pick up your sock, pick up your sock, pick up, pick mm-hmm. up your sock. Yep. Okay, Dad, and then she runs off. The sock's still here. Yep. Oh yeah, that's my life. Oh. <laughs> uh, mine too. Yeah. My mom loves yeah. it. She's just like, you know, she'll come and visit and she'll watch my daughter and she'll just, she's like, Ben, payback, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. Payback. So. That is too funny. Not funny, but funny. Um, well, you got to find the humor in it. If you can't laugh, then, you know, life is boring. You got to, you got to, you got to be able to joke. And I think, you know, parents that are listening to this, find the laughter. Okay. Because laughter's healing. And mm-hmm. and it does really help diffuse some of those those heated situations. And absolutely. And I think that when a kid can see a mom and dad joke with themselves, they're going to learn to to be able to joke with themselves. And and you've got to not take yourself so serious, and because if you do, you're gonna you're, you're gonna create so much anxiety. And I think a, a lot of these kids, and you're talking about um, the high school age. Uh, ADHD kids and, and the anger. Well, you know, on top of that, well, a lot of that anger is rooted in the anxiety. Mm-hmm. You know, these kids have so much anxiety and so much self pressure that they put, you know, that they're putting them on themselves to do well and to fit in. And, 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 um, you know, yeah, they don't also, want to be different. Right. Well, absolutely not. Because Mm-mm. if I'm different, then, well, how am I going to fit in? And if if I don't fit in, then I'm going to become a target and someone's going to post something about me that it's unsavorable and everyone's going to see it. And and so I think that uh, this these days are really difficult for these kids because yeah. on one side we're saying, OK, you know, to be out there in society, you have to have uh, some disciplines on, you know, how you react and respond to different things that might kind of tick you off or create some anger and anxiety. And I think that a lot of these kids, they, because they don't have an outlet for that, it just kind of compiles and it builds up. Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, that one day where maybe they didn't get enough sleep or, or maybe, you know, they just, whatever, 
it just they don't have the discipline to, to push it down and control right. it. And there's that impulsive explosion. And you, you talked about it in one of your books about how the brain can get hijacked. And, and when it does, I mean, it's, it's you literally as a parent can do nothing until exactly. it's over. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you fallen kind of, off what, the cliff. Right. So, you know, you know, the question is, is, uh, you know, what do you do? And, and, you know, you gave the, my introduction, I'm sure some of the parents thought it was weird that, you know, it said he likes to box. He's a boxer. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that, that has been one of my outlets for so many years now. And, um, it's it gotten so, um, so good and so helpful that um, we created a course and we did it this summer for kids that have neurological disorders and, and some uh, mild mobility issues. And these kids are coming in and they now have a physical outlet for some of those daily frustrations and right. struggles that, that are building up. And it's amazing when you, you go in and you hit a heavy bag with some gloves and you walk out and you're like, I feel much better now. <laughs> you know, exactly. I feel much better sure. now. Sure. So, so of course, you know, parents, you got to give your kids some kind of a, of a, a physical outlet and it can't be Minecraft and it can't be Nintendo Wii, but it's got to be something that really gets their, their, their cardio up. And, um, you know, and that's been a struggle for me and my daughter, uh, because she, she's a sloth. I mean, she loves, no, seriously. She's the other day, she's like, dad, I hate to sweat, you know, and, and I don't like to work out. <laughs> And the worst part is she loves to eat too. So, and she's got Girl, my, my, my body. Heart. Yep. Oh man. So she's, she's got this Nordic Sasquatch body and, and I'm like, kid, you gotta, you gotta come in. And so she's finally started coming into the gym, uh, during that class where we have all these other kids that come in that have ADHD and she's really starting to connect with it. And, uh, That's good. you know, and I kept telling her, I says, Annie, I'm not bringing you here because of something physical. I'm bringing you here for your mind. Right. You know, you're, you're going, we are going in here because this is, this is mental, uh, you know, training. This is, this is going to help you focus. This is going to get rid of some of that stress that you feel, you know, when you come home and you don't want to do your homework and she's starting to see a little bit of a, you know, some results. Yeah. I mean, there's studies that show that exercise and physical movement help with anxiety and with focusing your mind. And, you know, that the brain is a muscle and the more you exercise it, the better that it does. And, you know, there's studies that show that kids who exercise before school do way better in school than kids who don't. Um and it's unfortunate that we don't build that into our school day. Um, sure. We certainly should, but it's not a mainstream thing yet. Hopefully it will be in the future. But, yeah, just finding that outlet, I think, is really important. And, you know, if your child has an acceptable outlet for their anger, then they're not coming to you and lashing out. And if they are, you can remind them of that safer, more appropriate outlet. Um, but I think that so much of that comes from being misunderstood. Sure. Um, you know, they're misunderstood at school. He's smart. Why, why isn't he doing it or whatever? And, um, you know, then they come home and maybe we don't exactly understand. We're pushing them to do homework and not getting that how hard it is for them or whatever the situation is. And so, you know, just working to, um, understand as much as we can and then to validate their feelings, you know, whatever they're feeling is real for them. Um, and that's so powerful and so important and can certainly help in those instances as well. Um, I wanted to talk some about where you are today, how you became the chalk guy and how you, um, harnessed your talents and, um, and really made um, a career out of what um, you're good at and interested in. Sure. Well, <clears throat> today um, I am, oh gosh, well, today I'm in my office talking to you, Penny, and I'm enjoying every <laughs> minute of it. Why, thank um, you. You bet. So it's been, gosh, a little over 20 years. Um, I started in 95 and it was, uh, you know, I, I took some art classes in high school. Um, it was actually a, an accommodation that the school made for me. I, I was required to take two years of a foreign language, but my, my uh, principal, who was really kind enough to attend my IEP planning meeting, uh, individual education plan. Right. And um, 
I was, you know, every time I hear these little letters, I always say what it is because I'm thinking, man, there's probably a parent out there that's hearing this for the first time. And they're like, what in the world is an IEP? Right. Yeah. You know? And it was funny. I, I, I'm i going to digress for a minute, but I'll get back okay. to your answer. I'm having an ADD moment. <laughs> I was listening to uh, one of the uh, foremost recognized uh, ADD experts and he was doing a thing on NPR and it was really good, but he kept using the word comorbid. And, you know, I've done a lot of research and studying and, uh, you know, just using myself as a guinea pig to understand ADD to help people and, you know, feel like on some level, I, you know, I kind of have a handle on, you know, some of this information, but for the life of me, I could not figure out what the heck that word was. And he kept using it and kept using it. And I'm thinking, here I am, somebody who's read just a, you know, a ton of books and have been through some courses and I don't know what this word <laughs> is. If I was a parent, I'd be flipping out right now. Right. I mean, Morbid. you know. Yeah, comorbid. I'm like, man, it's terrible. You say my kid, you know, you hear the word comorbidity and you're like, oh gosh. So I'm listening. I'm like, okay, I got to Google it. And so just from that experience, I'm always trying to, okay, how can I simplify this and make sure that even though I know what it is, somebody may not. And so I'm always throwing it out there. And I I mess up half the time because, you know, these letters, I'm dyslexic still, you know, it's like everything (laughs) I'm talking about, I still have it. You know, yeah, I keep trying to explain that to my wife. She's like, hey, you need to go do this. I'm like, okay, I'm having an ADD moment, okay? I'm creating yeah. anxiety over here. But Too um, much pressure. So for over 20 years, I've been speaking and, and sharing my story. But when I first started, I was terrified to talk in front of crowds. I, it was like that old Jerry Seinfeld joke. I was uh, so afraid of public speaking that if I was at a funeral, I'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Right. And, uh, and like so me. my my brother oh, – well, hey, you're doing good. Um, my brother – did all the talking and I would draw. And so the accommodation that they made in school was Ben, instead of the two years of foreign language, you can take either two years of music or you can take two years of art. And I took art and I, I just connected really well with it. Um, I hadn't really done anything with it up to that point because when I was little, I got yelled at so much every time I dueled in class. And so I right. thought art was, I thought art was evil. And, um, Mm. and so now they said, no, no, go and do it. And I had a great teacher who really pushed me. And so I developed this, uh, this performing art. Uh, I'd seen a guy do it and became good friends with him. And before he passed away, he's like, Hey Ben, why don't you consider doing this? And, uh, and so my brother did the talking and I did the, the art and eventually people wanted to know my story. You know, they're like, Hey, we see this guy come out. He's like the great wizard of Oz. We never get to see his face and he doesn't say a word. So <laughs> Uh, my brother really pushed me and, and, uh, I made it, you know, we made a deal that I would show him how to do art if he would, uh, coach me in, in how to be a speaker. And, um, and so now he's out there still doing uh, his thing and I'm out doing my thing. And so 20 plus years later, I'm still doing it. And, That's uh, awesome. I, you know, I, I think I love it more now than I did, uh, uh, even 10 years ago, um, because I'm a parent. You know, every time most people that get into the speaking career or arena, they 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 start out with kids. I mean, that's just the typical, uh, you know, market. You just you start with working with youth because there's so many youth events. Um, You don't charge very much, you know, so you Mm got to do a lot. So you get a lot of experience. And if you're good, eventually you try to work into that corporate arena. And uh, one of the big differences between me and a lot of other speakers is I refuse to step away from the, the, the kid market because I just really feel so convicted that my story, you know, played out the way that it did so that I could, you know, turn back and, and, and extend some encouragement to these kids that are battling something similar. Right. And, uh, and plus it keeps me young. You know, my, sure. my, if my wife were on, she'd be like, he's just a big junior high kid that loves to play Lego. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and that's okay. And that's okay. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, you've got the rest of your um, life skills working, you know, oh, yeah. you're not just doing that. So it's perfectly no fine to let your inner child shine. That's right. I do the dishes. Come on now. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I, uh, right now I've got a lot of little things going on. Um, so I still go and I speak. In fact, I got a big tour coming up next week, uh, down in uh, Texas and I'll be doing about seven or eight shows down there. And, uh, yeah, when I'm at home, I'm, I'm, uh, really kicking up my, uh, my painting. And so I'm doing a lot more painting for people. Um, I had uh, spent, and I think when you and I first connected, I was spending a lot of time building apps as accommodations for kids uh, that were 
educational and entertainment uh, or entertaining and, and um, you know, so I've got seven apps out on the iOS store and uh, the, uh, the challenge that I discovered with that is you need about a hundred thousand dollars to market one of those. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, until I hit that lottery. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the really cool thing is, is that these, these apps that I created uh, took so long to do, uh, for me, as an individual with ADHD, they taught me patience. They taught me follow through, which is something that that adults that have ADHD struggle with a lot. Is mm-hmm. you know we start a lot of things, but we don't follow through, and uh, it really, really helped me to get through some of those personal battles. So that even now, when uh, when I'm painting, you know, I'm taking my time and I'm creating some things that I'm like, whoa, I. I can't believe I just did that. Cause usually when I'm performing on stage, you know, a piece of artwork takes 15 minutes. Right. And, uh, you know, now I'm just, you know, people are, you know, hiring me to paint like turtles, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> what? and so I uh, know I did this turtle painting. It turned out really good. I'm like, I don't want to give it away now. I and, saw uh, the chicken the other day. I was really, oh, the rooster? I was like, yeah. oh, yes, it's good. It turned out. It's her, yeah. Yes. It I was the weirdest, it. weirdest commission job I ever got. The guy's like, can you, can you paint me a chicken? I'm like, what? <laughs> he was like, it's a birthday gift for my wife. <laughs> I'm like, uh, you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend, buddy. I don't know about this chicken. chicken. And, That's um, funny. But there was a great story behind it. But anyway, so I uh, so I have, I have that going now. I've got a new website out called our, uh, BenGlenArt.com, which is really cool. And so people can go and see. And, and you know, it's funny. If you go to the, the website, you'll see how ADD I am because it's, you know, usually artists have one style they stick with. I've got like right. five styles. <laughs> I'm just like, I can't not do it all, you know. And, and that's that's just the ADD brain. And um, And so I just, you know, I think that for parents – Everything that, that you've shared, you know, as far as just continuing to try to find a way to keep your kids motivated is so important. And and if I, if I were talking to a group of parents right now on stage, I would look out at them and I would say this. If you want to continue to be an advocate and encouragement to your kid, you got to first take care of you. You've got mm-hmm. to take care of yourself. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, making sure that and now I'm going to sound like I'm lecturing, but, you know, make sure you're getting your exercise and you're, you're getting your sleep and, you know, go get, you know, a massage every so often. And, you know, the thing is, is that when you have kids, time speeds up. I don't know why or how it happens, but it, yes, does. it does. And and the older your kids get, the faster this time starts to move. And before mm-hmm. you know it, you've neglected you know, different areas in your life that really need to be paid attention to if you're going to be uh, giving back on a high level. And, you know, one of the things that I share a lot in my corporate messages is just I talk a lot about burning out. And, you know, in the workplace, that happens a lot, but it can also happen as a parent. Absolutely. You think about, you know, the, the idea of, hey, pour your heart into all you do, pour your heart. Well, one of the, the greatest things that we get to pour our heart into is our family. You know, when you have mm-hmm. a kid, it is it is a parent's responsibility to pour into that child's life. And and I believe that if a parent's listening to this podcast and, and I know this about you, Penny, just from our conversations, our kids are our greatest investment. Sure. And yet if we're pouring, 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 if you have the visual of a container, if you pour, 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 eventually that container is empty. Yep. And so if you're not pouring back in, so, you know, it's very, very, very important to, to and, and where that comes from is you taking the time to sit back. And I, I know a lot of people, you know, they use the word meditate. I, you know, you can call it that if you want. I, I think it's a little, every time I think of meditation, I think of sitting Indian style and closing right. my eyes. And, you know, I'm like, hey, my knees hurt sitting Indian style. Mm-hmm. B, when I close my eyes, my brain goes into ADD mode. So forget it. Right. Um, but a lot of, for me, it is, okay, I've got a list of 10 questions, you know, and I ask myself these questions, you know, very frequently. And, and, and what that is, is it's just a self-interview, you know, it's like, uh, doing a checkup from the neck up, you know, where's my mind, where mm-hmm. am I at? And, uh, what have I not been doing? What do I need to be doing? And so I can be at my best for my kids. And, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. And if, you know what, and if you're feeling low and you're feeling down or you're feeling overwhelmed, a, don't, you know, beat yourself up about being in that place, but just try to be mindful to do something to, to rectify it. 
So Yeah, that's why we have the Happy Mama Retreat. We do um, once a year for three days. We have moms um, who have kids with neurobehavioral or neurodevelopmental disorders come together for some respite and um, some education on self-care and some community with other moms who get it. And it's, it's really powerful. I think this coming May is our seventh or eighth year. Cool. Um, and I wish we could do it more than once a year, but you know, it, it's a big to do to pull together, but it's also um, not something that a lot of people can afford to do more than once a year, but right. it's just, you know, it's that time to take care of ourselves and you use the, the visual of pouring from a cup, um, which is great for parents. It's also really good for what we were talking about earlier about how much effort our kids are putting in at school Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're constantly pouring from that cup at school, how much is left in the cup when they get home or in in other ways too, you know, if they're trying to do, um, activities like sports or Cub Scouts and they go to the meeting and they're, you know, they're working extra hard and they're pouring from that cup faster than the other kids are. And, you know, I think that's really a really strong visual for parents to keep in mind. So I wanted to make that connection. Um, and I, I find it fascinating that you were not doing art your entire life because <laughs> your talent, your speed, what do you call it? Speed. Speedscape. Yeah, because I, I only draw well on stage. I only draw landscapes, so right. It you know. blows my mind. <laughs> like That's I fun. watch that, and I just am like, I am nothing. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just fascinating that to me that anybody can do that, and then yeah. to find out that you didn't always draw or paint is crazy yeah. like i'm so glad that somebody in your life in school said hey let's try the arts let's try something right. different and i think you know that's a good lesson for us as parents too is give them as give your kids as many opportunities to do anything and everything as you can and right. yes 95 percent of it or more might not work out might not be right for our kids but the only way to find that one Mm-hmm. thing there you know that drives their their lives almost is to just keep trying yep. you know we often give up and say well you know we tried these five things and nothing like that is going to work <laughs> and that's not necessarily true um right. so i think you know you're a great example for a lot of kids with similar struggles and challenges and that you um kind of came into what you wanted to do, where you were talented um, a little bit later and that you were able to take that and kind of run with it. Well, I feel really blessed that I I did have some great people in my life and and that's, uh, you know, that's so key. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of understanding or little understanding can go a long way for sure. Um, So I want to mention, of course, to our audience that they need to check out your work. They can go to simplybenglen.com. I will have links in the show notes. I will um, be sure to link to one of your videos of your speedscaping too, Uh, because I think it's mind blowing. Like the first time when I reached out to you and I, um, I called my kids over. I'm like, you have to watch this. They're like, oh, whatever, you know, and I'm like, no, <laughs> you have to watch this. I am not letting you say no. You have to see this. It's crazy. And my daughter, who just went off to college this year, um, is an art major. Um, so I really wanted her to um, see, you know, how po- how that can bring you to so many different places. Sure. You know, art can be out in the career world can be so many different things and, and things that you would never think could, could amount to something big, you know, like speedscaping, you do that at home on your wall, you know, you, it, right. you made it into something and it's fantastic and um, really inspiring, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and then for, you know, kids to watch that and say, oh, he used to struggle in school like I do is, you know, a really powerful message. So I want to be sure that our audience checks that out too. And, um, you know, I think you mentioned those 10 questions that you ask yourself. It might be awesome for me to be able to share that in the 
show notes too that parents can start teaching their kids to kind of do a self check in like that as well. Yeah, let me. Uh, you know what I may do is I'll try to maybe come up with some some that might be more relevant for kids. Okay, and um, that would be awesome. Get those typed up. Um, I try to spell check it. So you know, <laughs> but uh, you know the one thing that uh, we're really trying to ramp up again, and and you know that um, I've done a bunch of YouTube videos that are more ADD related. Mm-hmm. So if if any of your uh, participants have any specific questions that they want me to address that, that we may not have touched on. Um, I really am trying to collect a bunch of questions so that I can make some really, you know, short YouTube videos just to help continue to, you know, be an encouragement and and just help, you know, these parents hang in there and, and, uh, you know, maybe like you said, with your parent or with your kids, just maybe come up with something new and creative that might just be the ticket. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, you have a great energy and a really fun approach to things. And so, you know, for parents to laugh, I do like to laugh. Yes, you do. For parents to be able to, you know, use you as a resource and see sure. that I think is is more powerful than even, you know, me sharing what I have learned in books or experience. Um, because, you know, you sharing your story shares hope with parents that um, it might be hard right now, but it can get better. Absolutely. And that's really important, especially when we're down deep in the muck and we're really struggling. That's, um, you know, that the most popular speaker that we've had at the happy mama retreat in all these years has been, um, a mom of an adult son who has, I believe Asperger's. Um, and he has grown up to be a successful, happy adult and, you know, her coming in and sharing that story, everyone just loved it. You know, they all felt like they were leaving with a new light at the end of the tunnel and some hope. Right. And so, you know, that's a really powerful thing just for you being out there and sharing your story and being very open um, is certainly giving a lot of people a lot of hope. And that's awesome. Well, we got to keep moving forward. That's, that's our only option. I know so, it. I know well, it. Penny, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. And, Thank you. Know, you blessings in all you do and if i can ever do anything else for you hey i'm here yes we need to collaborate again we'll talk about that soon okay i love it thank you so much for being on and like i said the show notes will have all of the links to reach out to ben and um, i'll see you in the next episode thanks for listening to the parenting adhd podcast with penny williams If you like what you just heard, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Visit the website, parentingadhdandautism.com for so much more on successfully raising kids with ADHD. Be sure to check out the podcast section as well for previous shows. Join us next time for more parenting strategies and insights that actually work for kids with ADHD.